Well, hello and welcome to everyone. We're super excited to have you all here for the I Am A Connector storytelling session. My name is Melissa Butinsky and I'm here with my coworker, Gabe Opler. We both work for the Center for Large Landscape Conservation, an NGO based in Bozeman, Montana in the United States. Bozeman is located on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of many indigenous people, including the Opsiloki, the Salish Kootenai, the Pakani, and the Sitsitsta, who call this place the Valley of Flowers. As conservationists, the challenges that we face are wicked and the solutions are not singular or straightforward. However, we are not in this fight alone. With over 10,000 participants at this summit, we have the power of numbers, education, connections, policy, and force of will to redirect conservation towards a more equitable and just future for ourselves and our descendants. As the highly publicized movement for youth-led climate change activism has shown, young people are powerful change makers. Over the past week, this summit has brought together thousands of young people to bring this energy to nature conservation. Conservation success is not always easy for us to define, and it can't always be captured in the metrics that we're used to, such as traditional forums as scientific publications or annual reports. While important, these kinds of medias can obscure the personal experiences that make conservation special for many of us. Stories, stories are powerful because they can provide an opportunity to paint a fuller picture of our life experiences. They underscore the connections between people and nature, work and play, partnerships and friendships. Stories can teach us about overcoming challenges, embracing the unexpected or adapting to change. So today we have the great privilege to hear from storytellers from around the world. These inspirational individuals hail from 13 different countries. Each speaker has taken a unique path in their conservation career, and we will see how their passion for conserving nature and perseverance through challenges, big and small, has led to different forms of success, and how people just like you um, have found themselves at the forefront of equitable and effective conservation around the world. First up, we have Yui Zhang from China to tell us about the Oriental Stork. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me here. I'm gonna share my screen. I was not actually expecting me to be the first one. Okay, so can everyone hear me and see my screen? Yeah, okay, so uh, I shall start. So good afternoon or good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for having me here. My name is Zhang Yu and I am from China. It is my great honor to have this chance to share my stories with you. To start with, I'd like to share with you a story about Oriental sparks in China and how are they protected by our volunteers. Then I'd like to share with you my thoughts on two questions. Firstly, should we also protect the small wetlands in the cities? Should they be protected according to relevant laws? Secondly, why connectivity conservation is crucial and how can we achieve it? As a member of the China Biodiversity Conservation and Green Development Foundation, also known as the CBC DDF, I am proud to tell you that the CBC DDF has built over 170 community conservation areas in China on the purpose of preserving the biodiversity and support the sustainable development. With so many conservation areas and so much efforts devoted into the conservation areas, why aren't the animals not properly protected? To answer this question, I would like to share with you a story between our volunteers and the Oriental Stork. In case you haven't heard about the species before, I'd like to give you a brief introduction about it. The Oriental Stork is a large white bird with black wing feathers. It likes to wade in marshes, coastal beaches, and other wetlands. Its diet consists mainly of fish, frogs, insects, and so on. 
lovely as they are, unfortunately, they are defined as endangered birds in the world, and there are only around 4,000 oriental storks in China. To better protect the oriental storks, the CBCGDF decided to establish the China Conservation Area of Oriental Stork in Tianjin and Tangshan. These are two cities in China. Our volunteers once received a call telling us that a big wet bird was found on the rooftop and stayed there for more than two days. Our volunteers rushed there. They found an oriental stork in poor house and took it to the nearest animal hospital. This is him lying on a bed with a quilt and this is him getting the proper therapy from the wet. During the rescue process, we found that there was no food in the stomach of the oriental stork, which means that these oriental storks suffered from long-term starvation. But what leads to a starvation? This oriental stork was found in the neighborhood of Tianjin Beidagang Provincial Natural Reserve and the Qili Hai National Natural Reserve. After the two natural reserves reclaimed the farm pounds for fish farming, they protected the pounds themselves, but no fish was allowed in the pounds. So a large number of oriental storks cannot feed themselves here and have to fly to a private farm pound. However, the farm pound owners don't allow them to die there and use firecrackers to scare them away. Despite the lack of food, the oriental storks are also threatened by poachers. To better help them, the CBCDF spent five years establishing, developing, and improving the China Conservation Area of Oriental Stork in Tianjin and Tangshan. We also initiated a fundraising campaign, Five Chinese Yuan, a fish for Oriental Stork. These efforts finally paid off. What about the Oriental Stork we found on the rooftop? After days of cares, he managed to stand up and eat by himself. And these are all warning signs of human wildlife conflict, an issue faced by countless species in many countries. This brought to us two questions in mind. Firstly, should we also protect the small wetlands in the cities? Should they be protected according to relevant laws? Secondly, why connectivity conservation is crucial and how can we achieve it? You might wonder how the question about the small wetlands in the cities occurred to me. Well, that's all due to the CBC DDF's protection of the low spotted dragonfly on the left side of the picture and the bog bean uh, on the right side of the picture. In April 2020, our volunteers were so excited to once again found low spotted dragonflies in a small pound in the low spotted dragonfly reserve in Tianjin. They were excited because the low spotted dragonfly is the most precious species among the nearly 800 species known in China. When low spotted dragonfly was first found in Tianjin in 2005, our volunteers worked closely with local authorities to establish the low spotted dragonfly reserve in Tianjin on the purpose of protecting them. With this joint effort in April this year, volunteers discovered that the population of low spotted dragonflies in Tianjin has been growing and now the number of them can even reach tens of thousands. What about bog bean? Bog bean is a beautiful aquatic plant which carpets all the area along the riverside in Tiansongying in the suburb of Beijing. No one knows how long it has been living there. However, recently, the tens of thousands of bog beans suddenly disappeared and is now listed as an endangered species in Beijing. The answer is clear. It is now losing its habitat due to urbanization. Ironically, the local government spent hundreds of millions of Chinese yuan on flowers in the Beijing Garden Expo Park, but is unwilling to put any effort in protecting the fragile white flowers that are in danger. 
With that in mind, the CBC GDI found that China submitted a draft resolution on the conservation and management of small and micro wetlands in 2018 on the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, 54th meeting of the Standing Committee. However, the concept of small and micro wetlands is nowhere to be found in the draft of a wetland protection law. In the face of that, the CBCDDF initiated a webinar joined by 140,000 internet users to discuss how the small and micro wetlands can be better protected. The CBC GDF has, as always, been trying to build a bridge between the general public and the policymakers and trying to make the world a better place for all. Now let's move on to the second question. Why connectivity conservation is crucial? Recently, the Department of Natural Resources of Jiangxi Province decided to launch the Poyang Lake Water Conservation Project and build a floodgate to solve the water safety problems of Poyang Lake during the dry season. However, the CBC DDF expressed strong opposition and held many seminars to discuss this issue because the regulation is against the law of nature. Most of the lagoons in the middle and lower reaches of the Yangtze River lost their function as lagoons due to historical reasons. Not only are their families properties, but also the last and largest natural wintering ground for inland water births in Northeast Asia. Moreover, a floodgate built in the areas where rivers meet will affect the survival of the people and the ecological restoration. By then, the plunder of natural resources such as sand mining will be more frantic and the impact on aquatic life will be greater. So that's all the stories I would like to share with you today. And I'm really looking forward to all your beautiful stories. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any queries, feel free to ask me or contact us via the social medias listed here on the screen. Thank you so much. Amazing. Yay. Thank you, Yui. Um, Thank next you. Up, you did great. Sorry, you were first and had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Next up, we'll be hearing from Akash Patil from India, and he will be speaking about learning to coexist from leopards. Akash, take it away. Thank you, uh, Gabriel and Melissa. Thank you, IUCN Global Youth Summit and Center for Large Landscape uh, Conservation for this particular opportunity. Uh, hello, friends. Uh, today, I will be sharing you uh, with you a story from uh, my hometown, that is Vatishra, and it's about learning to coexist with leopards. So let's uh, like begin with the story. Western Ghats is a long mountain range parallel to the western coast of India. It is home to diverse and endemic flora and fauna. It is one of the eight uh, world's hottest hotspot declared by UNESCO. I feel privileged that my hometown, Batishra, lies on the eastern slope of uh, the northern western Ghats. Uh, you can, as you can see, like it is very beautiful. It is. Uh, Batishra is an administrative block in Sangli district. 30% um, of the block is covered by protected area called Sanduli National Park. It is a part of a Sayadri Tiger Reserve. Rest of the block is composed of slow mountain slopes, grasslands, scrublands, small villages, towns, and agricultural fields, as you can see in this image. Just. Shirala is a diverse in traditions, cultures, festivals, and indigenous communities. There are various types of communities uh, like here. Sutar, Sambar, Mahar, Mang, Gosavi, Bhui, Dhangar. All these kinds of communities live together. 
agriculture and cattle farming are uh, the major livelihood source of the communities out here. Bhatti Shirala historically was known for Nag Panchami, a traditional festival. Here in this image, you can see uh, ladies uh, worshipping a snake god, which, is, which was made out of clay. So it shows, it depicts that how like Indian culture is associated with the wildlife and the biodiversity around. That documentary, uh, this Nag Panchimi, documented by Nat Geo and Discovery back in late 90s. You can find those documentaries online available on uh, like YouTube and all. But nowadays, nowadays, Shirala is known for something else. For that, I would like to take you all uh, back to 2001. It was one of the beautiful evening in the winter season. Me and my father visited Udgiri temple, which was in the buffer area of Sanduli National Park. My father was a traditional hunter in past. He left hunting when I started working for conservation. Walking trails with him was a super fun. He had been a great teacher for me. He taught me how to identify animal signs, calls, habitats in the forest. So particularly in, this, in that particular evening, we attended the rituals, played in that temple, and uh, started walk, walking back on the trail. We walked around for two to three miles, and suddenly my father pulled me back and pointed, my, pointed me like 50 meters ahead on the trail. And a majestic male leopard was walking like on the same trail ahead of us. That was my first thrilling experience to sight a wild leopard when I was in, when I was eight. Indian leopard, locally known as, known as Bibitya or Bibitya Vag, is one of the most adaptable big cats in India. It uses wide range of habitats like grasslands, scrublands, forests to agriculture fields. IUCN declared it as a vulnerable species and it is protected as a Schedule 1 species by Wildlife Protection Act of India. Leopard generally feed on some wild fauna like langoos, wild pigs, hare, porcupines, and large birds, birds like Indian peafowl clo found close to the village areas. In Shara, Forest Department firstly recorded uh, human leopard conflict outside the protected area in 2009. Because of that incident, myths and stories uh, of leopards started spreading in nearby villages, which increased a panicking situation between the locals and forest department. From 2012, forest department started giving compensation to affected farmers for the cattle loss. We were concerned because of sudden increase in the leopard attacks. From 2014, me and my friends started recording activities of leopards in Shirara block. Like over the last six years, like we recorded various activities and we, we found, we came across few to some observations and some information received from forest department that showed that leopard distribution increased from two villages at initial level outside the protected area now up to 43 villages. And this happened within last 10 years. Earlier, it wasn't a frequent scene to witness a leopard, village, leopard in village area. However, major threats like deforestation, forest fire, lack of prey base made them move towards the human settlements. The leopard have used mountain slopes, sugarcane fields, stream sides, to move from one village to another. Villages having check dams became hotspot of leopard attacks. So as you can see, like in the image that the center, the dam is there and the surrounding habitat leopard were using 
to like outside the protected area from 2015 to 2019 total 151 leopard attacks were reported in the block and in that 178 cattle got killed in 43 villages these numbers are excluding the attacks on dogs and cats as you can see in this image the house and the uh, sugarcane cultivation around it from our social surveys we observed that there is a fear in communities people are afraid to go for farming activities some have stopped farming because of the leopard attacks one of one of the community member raised a question that the forest department is giving compensation for cattle loss which is fine but what if leopard attacks on humans many farmers who are, who suffered the cattle loss have constructed fencing around their sheds to avoid future leopard attacks on their cattle so some of them have prepared like shed or the fencing by using traditional uh, traditional woods and all and some have uh, like used the steel and all uh, fencing by analyzing the scenario on the both sides we understood that there is a less awareness and more fear in the communities so planet earth foundation and forest department collaboratively established a wildlife emergency services cell to implement community based activities to mitigate human wildlife activity sorry conflicts in this region we have tried to generate awareness about human leopard co coexistence in shirara block by conducting awareness programs and community workshops in leopard prone villages the increase the increasing population of leopards is increasing conflict in the region leopard being iuc and vulnerable species need conservation efforts yet there is a need of for further research in addressing coexistence in the region learning and research is a continuous process as the leopard and human interaction will continue in this region also it will reveal new challenges and new learning lessons every day we have tried to understand the communities their fear and how they have taken measures to coexist with the leopard coexist can be le can be best learned from through the collaborative approach between in indigenous communities ngos and forest departments and we hope to continue doing so thank you thank you akash what a story and there's lots of lessons that we can learn from it appreciate that next up we are going to head to indonesia and hear from naila asmi whose story is titled conservation is my birthright Hi, Horas. Apa kabar? My name is Naila and I am indigenous storyteller and also conservationist from Sumatra, Indonesia. Thank you very much for having me here and without further ado, I'm going to start my story and by the conservation is my birthright. Growing up in a palm oil plantation, I learned very much about how basic our relationship with palm oil. Ever since I was a kid, living in a rural small village inside of the palm oil plantation, it was my backyard, my front yard, and also my playground. It was the few all the eyes could see. I grew up with my mom telling me to marry a palm oil plantation businessman. so that I don't need to worry about myself. My uncle told me a countless story about his dream, which involving owning palm oil plantations for a better living. My friends, my family, relatives, anyone that I know told me to have a dream, which is owning palm oil plantations for a better living. But I had one thing that brought me far away from my small village books. I was a kid that often escaped in that quiet library in my school. Those books, brought me far away places than my village. It took me to the city, forest, sea, and many other places that I could imagine. 
until my desire to see what's outside of my palm oil plantation village couldn't be held anymore. I thought my parents that planned to put me in the arranged marriage when I was 17 after I graduated senior high school. I moved to the city saying that I'm going to pursue my higher education, the university. The city provided me with so many tales of dream, places that I thought only existed in books, the forest, mountain, sea, so much more that I would explore. It took me to understand myself as well, that I want to dedicate myself, for not only myself and family, but also so much more for a purpose. It took me to some organization which given me chances to step into the place that changed my life forever, the loser system. I never thought that that place I read, the place that have the amazing animal of rhino, orangutan, tiger, and elephant coexist together is actually standing tall. I remember that day, my first moment to step into the forest. I remember completely still how the wind whispered on my ears, beautiful lush smell filling my body. The dance of the tree welcomed me a little by of the animal as well. Never that I knew it also prepared me to see an amazing creature that changed my life forever, orangutan. I saw them from the tree, standing under the sun with glory, looking at me with so many stories that I bring countless such emotion to my soul. I finally knew what a love first sight means, and it changed my love forever. Since then, I made a promise of myself that I'm going to be their voices louder as I could. What rejection do feel it to you? Hurt? Well, I feel more than that. A couple of rejections that I had telling me that I cannot work in conservation. Who are you? You're not having conservation in the ground. You're just a woman. You don't have any knowledge. You don't know anything, they say. My heart feels weary. Is that right? Am I not knowing anything? What about my connection? Is that wrong or is it just my hallucination? It took me to decide that I always can do anything on my own, that you can do anything you want to. It took me to do voluntary work in conservation, working in two jobs to support myself and volunteering works. I teach children who live adjacent with the loose ecosystem forest knowledge, also the forest. I live to the fullest. I fight the stigma that I have to marry as soon as possible to be obedient, to stay at home not in the forest, to be the obedient Eastern woman. So much that I could tell, but my love to the forest is getting stronger every day. My sm the smile of my students to me every time they see me is such a really resonating answer that I would ever need to my struggle. Until my dream came true, I got a job officially in conservation. I finally could work on the ground with my skill in communications. I involved in the local NGO that protect loose ecosystem and wildlife in it. More that I could tell, I was the only woman surrounded by men on the ground. I joined the work to cover the story, to share the message and amplify voices. Challenges was more that I could tell, from sexual harassment, losing privacy, losing so many friends and relatives, missing so much important moment around me. I call that dedication. Still, I was considered to be only lucky. I don't know anything. I don't have any conservation background. I have such a really similar struggling, not really understand was it really my calling, passion, or hard work. Is it true that I'm only being lucky? Am I got wrong messages from the matter of nature that I'm worth it? Am I not understanding it enough? So much question. Is it my decision to dedicate myself in conservation against my family and friends are wrong? Why do I feel tired in the constantly work of validations with no far to an end end? This is something wrong, I would say. No way that these strong connections is something that is wrong. I stop and also take a moment to resonate anything, to proceed anything and break once more. I look at everything, analyzing everything, reaching my ancestor, got myself lost in the nature. I engaged in my story about my family, about the forest. They told me stories that I forgot. My aunt told me, remember when you was a kid and you play inside of the, our palm oil plantation village and you went back 
carrying a baby tiger that you thought as a cat. I was struck with strong realization, not that I almost killed myself, but I finally understood the real issue was. It's such a tragedy that the palm oil plantation that I used to live is the home of so much animal that suffer losing their home so much, suffer as well. I finally understood that understood that it's tragedy for me to finally be able to step into the forest at my adult age for so long to disconnect. My ancestor Batak indigenous used to live side by side with the nature. They lost their land because of colonial and so much more. I feel disconnected with my own nature for so long as well. It took me to understand my purpose. My people lose connections to our identity, our self, and our root. My Bata ancestors is conservationists in indeed. They respect the forest. Everything they practice consider the environment. They plant trees for their new beginning. Every time they cut one tree, they plant four instead. But our nature was taken. We lost connection. My spirit lights up once more, even stronger. No, I have such a full right to work in conservation. Because it is my responsibility, not only is my responsibility as a human to take care, but also it's my birthright as Batak indigenous. Nobody can tell me that I'm not capable. I'm staking my claim as protectors because it's my birthright. I continue my journey now, not I'm going to stop, never. Now I start my own page, not only to be the voice of the nature, but also to the open gate for the other indigenous women who wants to work in conservation. My journey is a really, really long way, but I know it's going toward it. Thank you very much for listening and see you guys. That was super powerful. Thank you, Nayla. All right. Now, next, we'll be moving on to Omar Soub. He is from Jordan, and he is also our youngest storyteller today. Um, I hope you guys enjoy this one. I know I do. If you are young, a teenager, or even a child who takes care of himself, his family, and his beloved ones, you have to listen to this message. My name is Omar Soul. I am 13 years old. And today I will be sharing with you uh, an important story. I'm a survivor from the Dead Sea flash flood tragedy that happened in Jordan Dead Sea about two years ago in the 25th of October, 2018. Tragedy that shook the entire world. Jordan lost 22 people, 14 of them are children. Most of them were my friends. During these two years, I wondered what happened in the accident. I looked for an answer everywhere. I asked everyone. All the answers returned to me as, it is just a natural disaster. So I decided to ask an expert. I knocked the door at the largest organization for nature, which is IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. I understand that if we protect nature, we protect ourselves. Everything happens for a reason. The flood happened because people abuse nature. So. Nature returns it to us by slapping us in the face. If we keep abusing nature, more natural disasters will keep happening. 
be part of the change. Be part of the union. Join the IUCN mission. Let the world hear your voice. This is just the beginning, and we will keep going. We are the future. Wow, thank you, Omar. And there he is. We, um, we're so glad that you're okay and that you were able to share your inspirational story with all of us. Um, just a reminder while I'm speaking that uh, for anyone with questions or comments about any of our storytellers, feel free to use the chat function um, to have a conversation. And let's see, next up, we are now headed to Nigeria to hear from Ibu Kunalua Balagun, whose story is um, called Conservation Through the Lens of a Layperson in Nigeria. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Hi. So I lost my connection a bit, so I'm back. But I know it's my turn. I'd like to share my screen. Yes. Okay. So I'm talking about conservation through the lens of a layman. And it's, a real, it's something that really matters to me because I feel like as conservationists, if we don't tell people outside of our circle what conservation is, then nobody wants to do anything about it. So I tell my colleagues a lot of time that we have to let others know about conservation. You can't just think or talk conservation in the academic area, in, in our research institutes and all. Every other person has to know about conservation. By layman, I refer to someone who is either educated or uneducated but has little or no knowledge of conservation. And I believe that to tell a layman what conservation is, you have to present it in a language that you understand, especially when it's tied to their survival. For instance, now, a farmer, if you tell a farmer to farm sustainably because it will increase his income, the farmer will do that because, you know, he wants increased income. Everyone wants increased income. And we do this through simple tools that anyone can relate with. Videos, games, stories, slangs, citizen science, etc. Where's my story in all of this? Who am I? Am I a layman too or am I a researcher? I'll be showing a picture slide of my growth throughout the years. Yeah, I was just a little kid who knew nothing about what was going on in the world. I was in my undergraduate, went for a few trips here, and this was when I started my master's degree, and this was me on the field. And at that point, I already knew that there was something called conservation, and this is me in a protected area with a ranger. Like I said, I, I started to, you know, understand conservation in my final year in the university. I did a course called environmental conservation. And that was where I began to understand conservation. That was where I was taught what conservation is and why we should conserve. But I didn't fully understand it until I started my master's in 2016. I had the opportunity to do my research in a protected area where I was able to relate with farmers. I was able to relate and that was when I knew that conservation is a really big deal because without these people knowing what conservation is, then I mean, I don't know. So this is a picture showing farmers that I snapped and some of my, my colleagues and some of the people there too. It was while doing my master's that I discovered that 
you know, some of these farmers, some of these hunters thought the government was robbing them of their livelihood because how can you designate a, an area that is protected without letting them know why they should designate the place? They thought you, they were robbing them of, they could not farm, they could not own. So they were really bitter as they were. They were bitter that, I mean, we can't eat, we can't farm, we can't own. Yeah, you are just punishing us as it were because they didn't know what conservation was all about. So despite all the efforts of rangers, despite all the efforts of government with CSR, poaching was on the rise. So I finished this research wanting a change. I felt things couldn't continue like this. Everybody needed to know. My next door neighbor needed to know what conservation is. I started to write, I started to tell stories. So now I tell people what conservation is and why we should conserve. I also tell them how they can conserve in very, very simple ways. Like I've told people how they can, you know, plant gardens, small gardens in their areas, how they can do some simple things that, you know, on the long run help conservation. I write on my social media pages, which you can see Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And I encourage everyone around me to speak up to. Let everyone know what conservation is. Talk to your neighbor, talk to your students, talk to everyone. I mean, I might have a small circle of influence, but if those in my circle can talk to someone else, then every, at least a large number of people will know what conservation is. And that is the reason why I do what I do. So you can say that I was a layman, and now I am an insect conservationist. These are social media. Posted on my on my timeline, I was celebrating World Water Day here. I call myself a, an insect an entomologist, and my research focus is on insect pollinators. And I study I study what aids their survival, what aids reproduction, and all. What I do is when I do this research, some of the results, apart from publishing them in peer-reviewed journals, I also share them on social media. This is an example of an article that I wrote. It's not necessarily my research, but it's on ants. I think if people can know the other animals, the other things that we coexist with, and you know, people can have a better appreciation for them. They can better appreciate ants. They can better they can better appreciate the air and water and what have we. So what next for me? What is next for me? The first for me is consistency. I keep doing this thing that I'm doing. I keep going over it over and over again. I keep doing it and I get better. I improve. Right now, I'm I got admission into. I got a mission for a PhD program. I'm working on funding, and I believe that I should start before the year runs out. This is my own way of making sure that I improve by the day. And the next thing I do is also to network, to let, to talk to people, attend conferences, like just for people to know conservation. Let us let everyone know that by all. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm very grateful. It's a great privilege for me to share this. Thank you. Yay, thank you so much. I always love hearing about people's approaches to really speaking about conservation. It's easy for all of us who love and live it every day to talk to talk about it, but to bring it out to other folks is incredibly important. So I love hearing that. Uh, next up, we'll be hearing from Luis Zambrano. Uh, he is from Venezuela, and we're looking at the implementation of flag species strategy in rural areas of Margarita Island. Hello, it's me, you all. My name is Luis Alejandro. I am from Margarita Island, located in Venezuela, South Caribbean. And today I'm here to talk about the implementation of the flag species strategy in rural areas of Margarita Island. Margarita Island is characterized by having a great biodiversity in the North Bayonne's over and underwater. 
In the waters surrounding Migrate Island, you can be found almost 66 of the species of Alaska ranch, sharks and rays, reported for the country. Even though it's high biodiversity, the fauna does not possess other nests or does not have regulations to protect it. Due to this lack of regulations, overfishing has been occurring over a decade, um, causing the local extinction of Rhinoptera brasiliensis and Pisces pectinata, which you should inhabit the region. Due to fish life strategy, a lot of ranchers are very susceptible to overfishing. That's why this project focuses on the spreading of information, the less ranch related marine environment and conservation policies, being our main target uh, fishing communities in the schools, which over the time have been very receptive. Since 2015, I've been working on fish and landing sites collecting data from the sharks and rays. Through all these years, I've learned that each town in Margarita Island specializes in the capture of a species or a group of species. For example, towns located north will focus on the capture of bottom associated species, species such as Narcina brasiliensis or Mustela sigmani, while towns located south will focus on the capture of bentopelagic species such as Atobatus narinari, Ipanus mutatus, or Ipanus americanus. This other specialization is due to the tools or implemented to use while fishing the persistent and unrelated fishing activity, the threat of overfishing may endure until the point of no return for Alaskan bench populations. Under these circumstances, a conservation program was needed, and that's why three years ago we launched a pilot program using the eagle ray as a flag species. But a problem appeared quickly, and that it's uh, due to its high biodiversity and specialized uh, fishing activity, a uh, single species wouldn't work for the whole island. For example, northern villagers wouldn't adopt a species from other regions and vice versa due to unfamiliarity. Currently, six species are being used in our, in our activities. These were selected based on how abundant these species were, were in on the landing ports. For Macanao, this region over here, micro sharks and manta rays are the ones who focus our talks in war groups. For the northern region, we talk about electric rays and hound sharks. For the eastern region, we focus on eagle rays, and for the south region, we focus on the stingrays of the genus Ipanus. Hundreds of talks, work groups, and reports have been done. A total of 11 fishing communities have participated in our activities. At first, it was very difficult uh, to approach the people within these communities, but with time and a lot of effort, they got to comprehend the key concepts and uh, the implication of what a conservation program is, especially their role as key elements in conservation policies. This project looks forward to work along the local government in order to help to coordinate uh, policies that regulate fishery activity and good practices around the island. Finally, I would like to hear your comments and questions. Best regards. Bye-bye. Thank you, Luis. I love how um, these stories have taken us through um, hardcore science, as well as uh, all the other ways that conservation um, takes all of us as people. Next up, we do have, I'm gonna be sharing another video, this time from Sarah Coolis from um, Baltimore, Maryland, United States, whose story is called Promoting Disabled Professionals in the Sciences. Hi, my name is Sarah Cruz. I am a recent graduate from West Virginia University here in the United States, where I studied wildlife resources and conservation ecology. What you may not be able to tell about me is that I'm legally blind. 
I lost the majority of my eyesight when I was in fifth grade due to a genetic condition known as Stargardt's disease. What this means is that I lost my center vision, but I still have my peripheral. Through enlarged font, assistive technology, and sheer determination, I've been able to make it in this field. Previously, I've worked hands-on with American black bears, birds, salamanders, and other species. Currently, I'm assisting a federal bird banter and also contributing scientific data to Frog Watch USA and Project Monarch Health. If you have a disability, don't be discouraged. I've had a fair number of potential employers and professors tell me I can't do it. You just have to find a way to adapt. Any employer would be lucky to have us through our ability to adapt and to be hardworking individuals. I've created a Facebook page called Disabled Professionals in the Sciences, where we can share adaptive techniques, share stories, and generally support each other. If you have a disability or just want to support the community, consider joining, and I'm glad you stuck with the sciences. That was awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah, I think you're online if you want to wave to everyone. Um, so I know we've been jumping all around the globe through these stories, but for this next one, we're going to stay right here in Baltimore, Maryland, and we're going to hear from Curtis Bennett. Um, he's going to give us a quick little talk about mentorship. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Curtis Bennett. I'm the Director of Equity and Community Engagement at the National Aquarium in Baltimore, Maryland. And I'm just really happy to, to be here and, and share a story about mentorship and the importance that mentorship plays um, in our career pathways. So as I share my career story, um, I want us to think about some, some questions along the way. Um, we all do have a life story. Um, and I fully believe that it's when we share these stories, we connect in really powerful ways. So as I share mine, I ask everyone to reflect, what's our own story? Who are the mentors in that story? How have they impacted your life story? And why did they have that type of impact that they did in your path? So for me, um, you know, my journey starts really with my why. Um, my purpose, um, which for me has really been having a fundamental connection to nature in a way that was most relevant and relatable to me. As a kid, I can remember just the joy, the excitement, the energy that I felt from being outside. I was creative. Um, I felt this feeling of awe, like, and still feel that to this day. I can see a bird doing what a bird does, the same bird each and every day, and it still is like magic to me. And, you know, I can think of those first initial mentors being my parents um, who saw this interest in me um, and continued to work through opportunities for me to have these transformational experiences in the outdoors. And, um, you know, as I continued to have, like, spend more and more time outside, I thought to myself, you know, not really knowing what this meant, right, from a career standpoint. But over time, what I realized was that as I was continuing to develop my, my career path and my interest, um, what, and my connection to nature and the outdoors, what I recognized was this goal that I started to develop for others, for myself, to say that one of my career purposes is to make sure that everyone can have the opportunities to connect to the outdoors in ways that are most relevant and relatable to them. And so when I think about the next steps of my, that path, what that meant for me was going off to school, I um, started out wanting to focus on pre-vet medicine. And because I thought, you know, if you want to work with animals, you want to become a vet. That's, that's what I knew. Um, I wasn't really as aware of other avenues and other opportunities at the time. And I really struggled. Um, you know, and it was when I was able to sit down with an advisor of mine in college who had known me for a while and is, I consider to be one of my really great mentors. And he sat me down and he said, Curtis, you know, as you know, life is never easy, but when you're in the right space and in the right place, things become that much easier, which makes sense because it's a little more natural to you. And it was around that time when I transferred over to um, environmental science and policy. 
And um, I instantly felt home, specializing in wildlife ecology and management. And um, I've never looked back since. And, you know, it was really that interaction with that mentor of mine that really helped ground me. Um, and it's these interactions that continue to help ground me in my purpose and in my path and help supporting me along the way. Um, and, you know, I feel as though um, throughout over the course of my career, there have been countless people who have, um, I would consider to be those personal mentors, those people who have always had my best interest at heart. And for that, I'm incredibly and ex just forever grateful. Um, and I think it's important, you know, when we think about our careers, our pathways, um, the work that we do in our industry, um, mentorship is leadership. You know, that continuing for us to participate and engage in mentorship opportunities um, really does make a huge difference um, within our various institutions and industries. Some other examples of, of where mentorship has really played a key role for me, um, even when as I've transitioned between various roles in my current organization, um, just providing that support of the types of questions I should be asking and thinking about, the, the types of, of work that helping me kind of hone in on the types of work specifically that I might want to do, the type of difference that I want to make. Um, you know, it's all through those important conversations with mentors that has been so incredibly helpful. And I think, you know, as in terms of those next steps with um, questions to think about, you know, I think about the best way of saying thank you to these people and who have been so impactful in my life. And for me, it really has shown up as um, the ability to pay it forward, right? The best way to say thank you to all these mentors that I have and continue to have in my career is to, to, do, this, to do the same, but for those that are, come, that are um, seeking that support themselves. So I like to say that mentorship is one of my missions. Um, it's something that I fully enjoy doing, um, sharing those lessons learned, but also learning. Um, from, from uh, individuals as well. It's a mentorship is a two-way street. Um, it's a transformational relationship. And one where both, both individuals or multiple individuals grow and learn together. And then thinking about, you know, why it's important to mentor, you know, that support that's needed to help elevate one another, um, to help push one another to be the people and professionals that we know we can be. And then, you know, I think about what makes a good mentor. Um, and the first thing is time and intentionality and availability. Um, I think that it is so critical, right? When we give of ourselves, when we give of our time to others um, and the support of others, being a good listener um, and listening to understand, making sure that we appreciate diverse perspectives and that we're learning from the lived experiences that we all bring. Someone who's honest and open. Um, there have been many a times that mentors have shared things with me that maybe I didn't want to hear, but I needed to hear it. And that was for my, because my best interest was at heart. And for that, again, I'm so appreciative. Um, that open and honest feedback, that open and honest dialogue um, that's going to help me continue to learn and help me continue to grow and be the best person and best professional that I can be. And lastly, it's, it's someone who's passionate. Leadership involves a lot of time, investment. And it's important to approach that with intentionality and passion. And so I also want to encourage everyone here that we are all mentors in more ways than we think. Um, you might not be in a professional mentoring program, but something to remember is that there's always, there are always people looking up to us, whether we know it or not. And you never know the impact that you will have on someone else's trajectory, career pathway, experiences. Um, you might not know that right away, but know that that impact is there. And as I conclude, I just want to share again the importance of sharing our stories, because that is one way, one of many, um, where we can have that type of transformational impact and provide the support 
to so many others in our field today. So thank you. Thank you so much, Curtis. And I'm so glad you're able to join us in the middle of your busy day. Um, and I just wanna uh, point out the last thing you said about us being, um, well, mentors for other people who are following uh, behind us. I think it's something important to remember even in a, this youth event where we're of course looking up to people um, potentially with more uh, power and influence, there's, we're also maybe finding ourselves um, you know, being models for other people. So that's really important to keep in mind. Thank you so much. Um, next on our storytelling journey here, and we're gonna keep, we're gonna keep traveling. There's just so many important uh, voices we wanna include. Um, we're headed to Russia, um, where Anastasia uh, is going to tell us a story called, We Are Not Trophies, Wolves, to Research, Not to Kill. I'm Anastasia. I'm working for the Dawuski Reserve as a researcher. And today I would like to tell you in brief about the gray wolf study in the Dawuria Steppe region. Thank you a lot. Uh, thanks, Gabriel and Melissa, for the great opportunity to share our story with you. I hope you find it interesting and probably important. So, but uh, let me first introduce who we are and where we are. The Ushki Reserve is located in the southeast of the Kalski Krai in Russia, on the border with Mongolia and China. Uh, the study area also contains the valley of Zara and Sasachevsky board nature refugees. All protected areas are the part of China, Mongolia and Russia, the Uri International Protected Area. The Dawuria ecoregion is quite extensive and well-preserved expanses of steppe in the world and was recently listed as the World Heritage Site within the landscape of the Dawuria property. However, it turned out that in spite of vast studying of wolves in the forest zone around the North Hemisphere, here is, here is the lack of knowledge of wolves living in the steppe and deserves much more attention as the wolf is a key species and uh, a, a top-level predator. While uh, local people's main livelihood is livestock and livestock wolf conflicts are quite common, unfortunately. That's why our project has two directions, three wolf biology and ecology studying and livestock wolf conflict studying. In our case, in vast open landscapes, with low snow cover to reach our purpose, the best way to study wolves in is GPS coloring and remotely tracking. But how to catch them? How to feed wolves with a GPS color? We can't use a leg, loop. It's not effective. Wolves just go around it and we don't have a helicopter either. So we found a solution. Apply sophisticated chase methods described for Asian wild asses in Mongolia. I would like uh, to show a short video how we do it. Please hold on a second. Here we go. We immobilized wolves from jeeps. First, the rangers track a wolf by paw prints in the fresh snow, then a chase starts. A few jeeps drive an animal, but wolves are so smart, you can see it. So it's, uh, believe me, it takes a lot of efforts to catch them. According to Russian law, it's prohibited to use a foreign drug. Therefore, wolves are Im immobilized with salazine at a dose less than suggested by veterinary. It helps to minimize immobilization negative effects. However, as a predator is just immobilized uh, and sometimes not very well, our rangers have to use creative resources to finally catch wolves and do lot, don't, don't let them move or run away. Such um, method can be a cop, 
catch him or even uh, deep net. Catch tools age by tools wear and by body size and examine to determine their physical conditions. Then to sure a wolf feels well, we wait while an animal starts to move and finally run away. How oh, beautiful. Almost all the rangers of the Dorsky Reserve are hunters. Such coloring method also changed their opinion about hunting wolves. Rangers admit that the hunting passion remains. You chase it, catch it, but you don't need to kill the animal, and that's great. But it's very difficult to change the opinions of a person who traditionally considers a wolf to be a pest and completely relies on animal husbandry for subsistence. And the last shot of the video was a young wolf named Dusty. He dispersed, found a mate, became an alpha wolf, but after three years, he was killed by pastoralis. The sharp herd saw a wolf running on the step and shoot him just because it was a wolf. In spite attacks on livestock were relatively seldom, attitudes toward the wolf are consistently net or negative and generally traditional here. Wolf livestock conflicts an emotionally related issue in rural communities often leading to pastoralist misjudging the perceived risk that wolves pose to livestock, and it's understandable. Uh, since 2017, year by year, I conducted annual survey among all pastoralists within the studying area, collecting data not only on the wolf depredation events and people attitudes, but also on their nature observations, interesting cases they saw or met some, someone or some animal, and we found that one driver of the increased conflicts and negative attitudes may be a poor knowledge of wolf behavior. And uh, we began to provide information on wolf behavior, its role in the ecosystem and preventive measures among pastoralists via face-to-face -face conversations and the mass media. But the most important is face-to-face -face meetings at eye level. It allows to build collaborations with a personal approach to every person, to every shepherd, to every pastoralist. It's also important because the most of respondents cannot leave the pastoralist camp to take part in the meetings at village. And pastoralists believe our annual survey and conversation make them feel involved in nature conservation process. And we got the first result. Conflicts with wolves became less and less, as well as negative statements. But of course, it's just a start of a long way. Unfortunately, as time is limited, I'm, I'm not going to tell you more on our results. You could find some of them here by link below. I just want to say nature conservation is difficult and probably it becomes more difficult year by year. But in spite of it, wolves never give up and we won't stop. Thanks a lot for your attention and please don't hesitate, contact me. Look forward to hear you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much from Anastasia. Um, so now we're going to move from the Arctic Circle down to the equator. We'll be hearing from Anthony Ocheng from Kenya, who's going to tell us the power of conservation story told by a local. Karibu, Anthony. Hi everyone. So I'm just trying to figure out and share my screen. Uh, so just a moment. There we go. So let me tell you a story. So one day, my mom got me this book. Uh, it's called Oliver Twist. And then he told me to read the book and align the difficult words. Uh, so trust me, I knew what exactly I was told. It's my mom. So I went down, started reading the book, and underlined all the difficult words that I've seen. But of all these this difficult words, there's this one word I, I kept on underlining. And this word was and. Yeah, funny enough, 
I was in grade two, I didn't understand what an was in the sense that I couldn't even know what exactly is the role of and in a particular sentence or paragraph. And this is actually what happens in, in every wildlife space or nature today, because people do not know, do not know the importance of wildlife and how we are connected with it in one or another. And that is how I decided to be a connector. And being, being a connector, I use photography and film to connect people with conservation science. Having a background in conservation science and having worked in a couple of organizations in the conservation space, I felt as much as I love working for these amazing conservation organizations, I can't change the perceptions of people at home who do not understand why exactly am I doing wildlife and how does it even help me or you? So the word and kept on pushing me to actually asking myself, why exactly am I doing this? And that's why the power of storytelling comes in for me. So using media, and for me, it's photography and film, is a very powerful tool for me to tell that particular story. And I moved from different ecosystems telling different stories, not only about the beautiful wildlife, but the behavior of wildlife, the people conserving the wildlife, uh, the issues surrounding wildlife and nature. And that's what drives me to actually telling that particular story. And we do not just tell the story to the people at that particular point. We tell people from today and also in the future because these images stay to tell the story for tomorrow. But let me, let me, let me not say the one and again, but I'll continue. So forming 21, 21 became more of a platform for me to share these amazing images that I'm taking. And with that, I took in mind the aspect of science. Uh, being uh, having a background in science conservation is linking up that I understand what wildlife science is. And we have done so amazing papers out here on conservation issues, on issues, but these papers are read between conservationists and not the people who are actually down on the ground. So how do you simplify this to humans is by telling them that their pattern parcel of this particular wildlife and any interference they have will affect the ecosystem balance. And then we have so many contemporary issues going around. We have climate change, we have human wildlife conflicts, we have natural disasters, we have, we have a lot going on, but all of them are triggered by one particular source, natural resources. So if we are not able to package this information and create awareness campaigns that can actually communicate the importance and why we really need to conserve this particular species does not really make any sense. So for me, the word and is a very key important aspect for me because why exactly am I here and what's my role in supporting conservation? And that brings me to just a couple of stories I've done uh, here and there. So there's a the Mangrove conservation, it's a beautiful image. Yes, but then what the mangrove system face across the continent is too much. Logging, uh, deforestation, illegal poaching of, of that. But then there's a community somewhere doing something interesting, working together to tell a particular story. But these positive stories are the ones we need in a society that we are in right now. As much as we know that there are disasters, we have COVID-19, we have health issues, but we need to document positive stories that actually inspire people to continuously conserve, conserve nature. So this is just a typical image of roots uh, of mangroves. But then how do, you, how do you make somebody get wow about mangroves? You go an extra mile and create an image that is powerful. So for me, the local communities or the people I interact on a day-to-day -day basis my peers, my friends, when they see this particular image, images, we have, we start a conversation. Where is this located? What exactly are they doing? Why are they doing them? And how can we really help? So the word and comes in and in, in every particular aspect of communicating. As much as I didn't understand the word and in the beginning, but right now I keep on remembering that that particular word made a very, very big difference in making that particular story. 
uh, story last. So this is just a series of images because as much as I categorize myself as a wildlife photographer is that you can't tell a conservation story without including the people. The people who work on a day-to-day -day basis to conserve them, the details, the restoration effort, because this is just an example of uh, a mangrove ecosystem that has actually been uh, rehabilitated over a given period of time. And apart from that, I go a step further and actually make motion videos, uh, and motion pictures where you can actually watch uh, and understand why exactly are they conserving these mangroves. And, and if you want to have a glimpse of this, you can go to our YouTube channel and actually have a feel on why exactly are mangroves important. So this is just one example of the stories of hope. And in a community that is working towards using carbon credits to conserve this particular uh, ecosystem. But this cannot be known if somebody else can communicate it, especially when it comes from a local person, somebody who stays with them, somebody who they see on a day-to-day -day basis uh, buying goods and stuff next to them. It's easier for me to relate with them and tell them, you know what, these mangroves are important. And if you continue conserving them, they'll not only protect you from any natural disaster, but they provide for you food on a continuous basis. So this is actually very, very important. Jumping to another story is, people look at rangers or people who have guns and protecting wildlife and, and moving around, but these are human beings just like us. These are our brothers, these are our sisters, this is my uncle, this is my dad. But then what other story can you tell of a ranger who takes their time on a day-to-day -day basis with little just to preserve and conserve that environment? Telling that other story of a ranger is really, really key. And for me, that is the reason why I do what I do is because I want people to understand that every aspect of a conservation is important. They have emotions, they have feelings. They work on difficult situations just to preserve and conserve the environment. And if you're not able to understand this, uh, like one of the speakers says, the layman person, if they're not able to understand this particular aspect, it brings that conflict of why should I really conserve something that I do not have benefit from? You really need to define that particular part. And that is why telling the story using photography and film is key, but not just telling that story with pictures and, in, and moving images, but being a local and coming from that particular community also play a very key role in connecting you with, with, with the society. So there are just a couple of images of, of uh, a gentleman called Kosgei, who's, who's been working for Kenya Wildlife Service about 15 years. And uh, if you listen to his own story as a person, it, it gives you that hope that he's actually sacrificed a lot just to be a ranger. And not just a ranger, a ranger for rhinos, conservation purely, on a day to day basis, not sleeping in a cozy bed like some of us would go to right now. We'd be walking day and night just trying to protect wildlife. And not only rhinos alone, but any other wildlife. But these are stories that you don't see on a day to day basis on, on national media or media news. But then, how do we propagate these stories to the forward? So, when you share such a story for me on social media, you get to interact with other people who are not necessarily in the conservation space. And they keep asking themselves that particular question, and what can we really do? And that is the part where educators come in to play that particular role. And this is what you can actually do to support, to support conservation in the future, not just today, but in the future too. These are just a couple of images of this particular story. And for me, in every particular story, I have to create a, a motion video, which just helps build up the momentum around it. So why was I telling you this story about my mom? Is because that evening I was I was given the African beating of a mom because I could not just define the word and. And from today, trust me, if I see the word and, I know how exactly it is. And if somebody asks me why exactly do you do what you do and what's the benefit, that particular and plays a key role. The benefit of what I do is inspire other young people and older generation to understand that conservation is key to their life. And that's my story. Thank you.
Tony, thank you so much for sharing um, your story about stories and uh, including that beautiful photography. I'm hoping maybe you can put the links to your social media pages in the chat here so that when we have more time, we can, we can check it out more fully. For now, we are going to turn it over to Iris Berger. Um, Iris, if you're on the call, maybe you can give a wave and then I will get your story lined up, which is called Lessons Learned from Leading Fieldwork-Based Conservation Studies Across Five Continents. Thank you so much for having me today. Over the last seven years, I have led and participated in numerous fieldwork-based conservation studies across the tropics. And today, I would like to share with you some of the lessons I've learned, both for expedition planning and conservation as a whole. So first of all, I cannot overstress the importance of local engagement and local leadership for the success of expeditions in terms of being able to deliver tangible results that can inform conservation policy and management. Moreover, I try to ensure that the expeditions I conduct are inclusive, democratic, and help dismantle and entrench power inequalities and build local conservation capacity. In 2016, I conducted the Sumatra Mega Transect, which entailed walking across the whole island and recording all the birds we encountered. And as part of this expedition, we collected data in an incredibly dense and moss-covered forest that was previously completely unexplored by scientists. And this would not have been possible without the support of two, two incredible Mar Sumatra mountaineers in our team. They're both very passionate about seeing this forest protected, and I believe they hold irreplaceable roles in ensuring that it will. But they might not actually describe themselves as conservationists because the day-to-day -day job entails selling t-shirts. But I believe that they are the forefront of conservation in Sumatra. I think the idea of anyone and everyone potentially being a conservationist is a very powerful one, rather than conservation just being the exclusive domain of the scientific community, of conservation biologists or people working in the field. My second point, is that I believe that contemporary conservation as a whole has systemic flaws and needs to be restructured to be more resilient and socially just. Most recently, I have been planning an expedition to Guinea to identify wildlife corridors and assess West African lion habitat suitability. I was supposed to go last autumn, but this obviously has not happened because of COVID. Um, I think the pandemic has really highlighted the fragility of conservation efforts in Africa and beyond. In my case, I'm lucky to be closely collaborating with an NGO that has not been affected by funding reductions, and they could continue the on-the-ground work, and they will be setting up camera traps and checking them on my, for my project until I will be able to travel myself. However, globally, the pandemic has resulted in impaired conservation operations partly due to, amongst many other factors, depleted management capacity. African conservation needs African leadership, and specifically leadership from those living closest to nature, those whose cultures, history, and land, and all that lives upon it, are inextricably linked. My second lesson is about proactiveness. I would like to stress the importance of proactiveness in terms of both building your conservation career, as well as the direction the conservation movement as a whole needs to go. All my expeditions started with an email, or rather a lot of emails, to authors of scientific papers, managers of research stations or local NGOs. I was put in touch with the two Sumatra mountaineers via a friend of a friend or a friend who was previously filming in Sumatra. For my undergraduate dissertation, I have studied chimpanzee habit quality in Uganda. And this was really only possible because of the mentorship from two primatologists 
who agreed to support me after I had already emailed about 30 other researchers. I received a National Geographic grant for this expedition, which opened up a whole community of explorers and conservationists, which will be very useful for the PhD field work I'm planning to India. So establish and cherish the connections with people. Conservation success depends on it. You never know where and when people you've met will pop up and become key allies. More broadly, I think to reconnect with nature, we need to reconnect with each other. The same forces that are causing climate breakdown and the sixth mass extinction, namely consumerism and materialism, are leaving us estranged from each other and from the political environment. People who are thinking in different ways in a range of different sectors, societies and cultures need to connect and create a platform for which conservation can become the force it needs to be globally. I also believe that conservation efforts themselves need to be more proactive. Conservation actions tend not to address the drivers or target the sectors causing the greatest impact. They are often reactive, responding to the accrued effect of human activities sometimes years later and far away from where the impact occurred. However, I believe we need more proactive conservation approaches to reduce the underlying threats to biodiversity. To safeguard biodiversity, we need to know where and how it is most likely to be threatened. For example, we can use models to predict where land use change is most likely to occur and combined with species habitat maps, estimate where the impacts of agricultural expansions are most likely to be um, particularly severe. My last lesson is about perseverance and maximizing your potential. I strongly believe that organizing your own expedition or starting your own conservation project maximizes the potential for professional and personal growth, as well as conservation impact. I led my first expedition when I was 19. There was no academic or conservation component to it. I cycle across Bolivia. But this adventure was possibly the most confidence building thing I've ever done and really a defining moment in my conservation career. By completing something, I was generally unsure of what I could do. I learned an incredible amount about myself, including my resilience and potential. And it allowed me to plan expeditions of increasingly greater scientific merit and conservation impact over the following year. Planning your own expedition of feet work is certainly a lot more work and a lot more stressful than joining an existing one, with lots of thought-provoking challenges along the way. But I believe a lot more rewarding because you care, really care about the project and you really push yourself to ensure its success. Moreover, I also think it teaches you how to persevere and deal with uncertainty. In all the expeditions I have led, things did not go according to plan. From my camera traps getting confiscated by, by the Ugandan police because they thought I would use them to spy into governmental buildings, to having to completely change my project area because I did not receive the permit that I needed. I believe that perseverance will be needed for the political struggle that is to come because we need transformative change for biodiversity. We need a conservation revolution. We need to address the root causes of biodiversity loss, which are agriculture and climate change, but ultimately driven by capitalism. We need to move beyond the dogmas of capitalism for a system that is fit for the 21st century. And we need a conservation approach that goes beyond protected areas and the faith in markets to incorporate the needs of humans and non-humans within ecologically interconnected and just landscapes. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Iris, tackling some really big issues. And I do believe if it taught us anything, 2020 probably taught us all a bit about perseverance. Uh, moving on next, we'll be hearing from Andrea Morales Rivas. Uh, from El Salvador, and she will be presenting on From Bats to Cats, o Overcoming New Challenges.
Hello, everyone. Thank you for um, inviting me to be part of these amazing sessions. I get inspired a lot, listen to other stories. And today I'm going to share my personal study that I'm entitled From Bats to Cats Overcoming New Challenges. And I think if you are facing a new adventure in conservation or you are just starting in a new position or working with a species that you never were before, this perhaps can give you some optimism, some encourage, encourage you and of course, make you feel that you are not alone in this path. So my story starts when I was very at the very early stage of my bachelor studies in biology. And there, together with colleagues and friends, we started this group that we call the Bat Conservation Program of El Salvador. And there, we were the first group who were able to, to study, do some um, educational activities regarding bats, and do research about it. And in, during this time, I was able to learn a lot about myself, but also learning how conservation can be, is important and how conservation is everywhere, no matter if you're talking in a small school in a rural town or in a big city, or if you are in a Congress talking about a small, a big research. So this touched me, all of this told me that conservation what uh, matters and can bring people together. You can be that connected that connector between society, science, and communities. And that's what it matters at the end. So but at the time I was thinking, okay, but will be my species to be, <laughs> it will be my full engagement and so on. And with that in mind, I applied for a scholarship and I got it and I started my trip uh, to Europe. So the, once there, I was looking for my master, <laughs> a project that involves some kind of bats. I want to do bats. And unfortunately, I couldn't find something that really suits with what I was looking for. So I started to look in other places and thanks to um, my cycle of friends, I got this chance to participate um, in this opportunity with, uh, with a national park in Germany who went to try to do like, a, we can say like a project with wild cameras and study uh, the biodiversity, the, terrestrial biodiversity in a national park in my country. Of course, I was super excited because I never had this opportunity. I never worked with this kind of technology. But at the same time, I wasn't sure if it's, I was the right fit for it. I mean, I was spending years and years doing bad, uh, um, <laughs> be a bad scientist. I have uh, tons of experience with that. I have a network in doing bad. And I was still, I hesitate a lot before jumping in this new adventure. But at the same time, I was like, okay, but this can really be, uh, has a big impact in conservation and we can really learn from that and expand this uh, new approach in, our con in my country. So I took, the adventure, uh, I took the adventure and then once there, they trained me, of course, because I didn't have uh, experience on manage this technology. And I never touched a camera before that. So it was kind of excited, but at the same time, there was many nights that I couldn't sleep because I was concerned if I was going to do it right or not. But finally the project was there and it happened and it was, everything went well. I could train and share knowledge with communities, also with rangers. They got really uh, excited about the show a really true engagement in learn and provide and nowadays the project is still going on despite the difficult situation with the pandemic and the people are still excited about what else can be done and this was just a part of it and when i was doing this project of course i got amazing picture for cool animals and i wanted to share some of them here but there was one picture who really changed everything and maybe that picture is the reason that i was um, the reason that I'm, I'm here. And this picture was about a uh, not so little cat. <laughs> it's about a big cat that we, uh, you maybe know it as a puma or cougar. And this species, we were, we before this picture, we were not sure if they were still in our country. There were more than three decades that there were not reliable uh, record about the species. And once in one year, we took picture of it. Thanks to the project that I was involved but also another colleague from, uh, from my country, they were doing the same. So in 2009, we sit together, we start to talk and we say, okay, we must do something and try to see how we can help in the conservation of these species. And when we were doing, um, 
working to do this publication and take this in also in social media and so on, we realized that there was not any effort for the conservation of wildcat species in our country. And we have in, our, in El Salvador four um, wildcat species, and there were not any effort, not from the NGOs, not from the government, no, anything. And we start to wonder like how they are doing now. I mean, we know about that there is massive um, impacts on this on this species thanks to the expanding of agriculture and thanks also to the roads collisions that so there was this discussion and then the pandemic came and we have to work everything virtually i was in germany my colleagues were in el salvador and at the middle of the pandemic in the middle of 2020 we decide to our well, the, the organization the one ngo where i was collaborating decide to create a wildcat conservation program. And they offered me to me to be this, uh, like a coordinator together with another, uh, with, another, with the other colleague that I was working in the publication. And at the beginning, I'm not gonna lie to you, it was like, I hesitate a lot. I was a lot of afraid. I had big concerns, big insecurities, because I wasn't feel like, what if I'm not right for this? Or what if I don't do a good job? Or what if I don't have the strong background you need to work with these species and I don't have years of experience? And of course, all of this fill, fill my mind every night before I set them. But at the, at the same time, I was feeling this motivation and I was feeling like this is the right thing to do. This I can contribute as little as I can, if I uh, as much as I can, sorry. I can contribute and help to protect these species, to talk about these species to common people, to the people in the villages, to the people in the city, in the media, etc. So this really was a push and thank God and the motivation part really wins against the insecurities. And of course, I feel like there are many people who perhaps are facing the same. I think in conservation, as Iris highlighted, there is this uncertainty that we cannot control stuff going on. And pandemic is one good example. However, I think when you have this motivation and when you find a good thing that you can really trust and when you really want them, um, this little uh, push that maybe you are not an expert, but you are there, you are the local there and you can really change what is going on. And now we, in this program, we are talking with uh, government authorities to implement strategies for the conservation and the study of these wildcats. And if you ask me today, if I will be, if, la if one year ago, I will be able to share this with you, I will tell you like not, but this, this is how things happen. And now we are trying to really work for these four species and for the habitat when they inhabit. And I hope we can make it. And I hope that this can be um, this can inspire to those who are maybe dealing in new position or in positions that they don't trust on themselves or they have these dark moments when you the insecurities came. So you are there because a reason and maybe the reason is you just need to find it and you just need to contribute and they can help the species and the people and the society and a country to really know their species and help to preserve them. So I hope that I can bring more news in the future and you can and I can share more of our uh, small steps through this adventure. But thank you again for the organizers. And if you want to follow our stories, here are the social media of the NGOs. And thank you again for the for, uh, for the invitation. So see you and good luck to everyone. Thank you so much, Andrea. Her power went out this morning and you would never know that was so smooth. Thank you so much. Um, we are we're getting towards the end of our storytelling journey here. Um, in fact, we're now traveling to Tuesday um, to Tommy Esau, who is in the Solomon Islands, um, who woke up early to join us. Um, turn over to you, Tommy. You're muted. You're still muted, Tommy.
can you hear me now? Thanks everyone. Um, it's um, a very good morning here from the Solomon Islands. And uh, thank you for the chance to be able to connect with you all uh, and listen to your, to your fantastic stories and amazing work that you, you've been done. And so I'm gonna share with you all about the um, a small work that I've been doing with my community in the Solomon. Um, and so I'm currently working as a director for the Barrow Conservation Alliance. And um, I'm gonna tell you about um, a small work that we've done um, with my tribe. Uh, so just to give you a, a small background about where is my location, it's a small, tiny um, island. Uh, you can't see, actually see it in the map, but uh, this is where I come from. And this is my island, Malaita. And so I am just in here. This, this is where I work. And so this is the people that I work with. And so um they live close to the nature and um they are the last group language group who still practice ancestral religion and culture and ancestral worship at the core of choir religion and the choir practice so they are the last group in the solemn island who are still keeping their culture and um, maintaining their traditional um beliefs and so uh, many cu cultural practices um, remain well lost in other places, uh, not only in the Solomon Islands, but in the world. But like we are so, I'm so privileged to have been permitted to work with this, um, with this tribe. And so, um, and the environment, as you can see, is still pristine and uh, the bush, uh, and so I've, I've just being able to to have worked with uh, this this group, and so realizing that that we have a need uh, to preserve um, our environment, and so because of the traditional knowledge is disappearing due to changes in the education way of life, and so that's why um, it is important um, to keep. Um, this knowledge. And so in, in 2016, um, I've worked with this community to build um, a cultural center and also a, an archive uh, to, um, to collect history and also store many of the work that we've been doing. Um, and so <clears throat> this archive has been started um, since um 1980s were bike before i was i was born but then um, i was so fortunate that i can be able to work on what has been established and so in 2014 to 16 we were able to get um a small grant from the iucn uh, to work on documenting uh, medicinal plants um, and so we started working with these local people, documenting their the knowledge around traditional plants and animals. And we started uh, working on um, uh, um, writing about the, the birds, uh, snails, insects. And so basically just documenting the animals and um, the unique species that we have in our environment. And so we start working with um, the international institutions like James Cook University in Australia and also um, Australian Museum. So this is just an example of some photos that um, just to give you an idea of what we've done. So we've done some mammal survey um, to look at um, the unique species that we have in our environment. And so we're trying to identify some endemic species and um, in 2018, we've also worked with some um, bird specialists from the Australian Museum. And um, we were fortunate to discover the four endemic species. 
that has found nowhere else in the world, but we still have them in our in our environment. And so um, this is also, <clears throat> sorry, I've just shown you this picture, just giving you an idea of what we've done. And in 2019, we've done uh, another survey on frog. And um, there's one species who is still um, in investigation, um, whether it's a new species or not. Uh, but this is just to give you some idea of um, the expeditions that I've helped lead um, with the Australian Museum and just to help local people understand what are the value and what are the species that we have and why are we keeping or conserving um, these, um, these species. And so <clears throat> the conservation work that we've done um, also um, led to many big social benefit and uh, it also helped us resolve a long outstanding issue um, since 2019 um, and so we were able to to resolve this issue because of the conservation effort that we've done uh, this, this is just an impact of the work that we have done and so from the work we have done we've helped to establish four conservation areas that um, we're now managing and we've been involving on some work on reforestation and also we've established um, a cultural school and also we're supporting some um, livelihood activities because local people they depend on the environment and so sometimes it's hard to get funding and so we have to look for alternatives that um, can help people get income and to support their family. Not only that, <clears throat> we've also helped to build sanitation to local peoples, train ranger um, on TV. And so our, our work now is sort of holistic. We're trying to look at uh, addressing the need of people through their health, uh, environment, and also um, some work on uh, mapping and also um, doing some capacity building doing some training with rangers. And now we are um, employing about 54 part-time uh, rangers and workers who have now <clears throat> um, looking after um, the work that we have established. Even though um, there's a lot of impact and achievements, um, the work that we have done faces a lot of challenges as well because uh, in the remote mountain, there is no education. Um, in the place that I'm working with, there's no health and services. And um, the biggest challenge we face is the mindset of people, their attitude, and also logging is our main threat. Um, and also um, a sustainable future. Uh, and of course, um, as many organizations, um, the funding is all, always a challenge. What is our next step? So our next step is um, we wanted to do more um, awareness to a lot of communities and we want to do more training for the rangers and we want to do more mapping because it is very important for our work um, and also do more surveys and seek more fundings for help. And also I think uh, the biggest thing for us is to support more livelihood and food security because of the impact of, of, of climate change. I think um, I like what um, one of the conservationists has said, David Attenborough, I think many of you have known him. I like what he said that we have a responsibility to care for the natural world. We are the most powerful species that involve on this planet that we are so powerful that we can destroy anything. And that is what we have done. But now we need to recognize that we are the custodian of this natural world and we have the moral responsibility to look after um, the creatures which we, which live in the world. Um, this is just a link to um, just my contact if you're interested to follow up on our story and just this is the link um, to our Facebook page and also to one of the um, to 
one of our website that I've also worked with the Atifi Health Research Group. I, I want to close with this from Mahama Gandhi. Um, if you want to make change, be the change you want to see in the world. Thank you very much. And I'll leave it there. If you have any question, then you can ask maybe later. Thanks, everyone. Truly awesome story, Tommy. Uh, just really amazing. All of these have been so amazing. I couldn't be more pleased how this group has come together. And especially for the participants who have stuck it out with us throughout this entire thing. So for our final story, we will be hearing from Oleyemi Ajayi uh, from Nigeria. And she will be telling us about building a career in conservation as a woman. Uh, take it away, Oleyemi. Hi. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Hello. Hello. Can you all hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Thank you. So I'll be talking about beauty in career in conservation as a woman. My name is Olai Ajay from Nigeria. So what inspired my career, my career in conservation? What inspired me? Growing up in Nigeria, every parent's dream is for their children to study banking, nursing, medicine. No one wants their children to end up in the forest, we are ended up. <laughs> so I see that so many trees, so many plants I knew when growing up are no longer available today. They have become so extinct. Our national plants, which I was very familiar with when I was growing up, has now become endangered in Nigeria which is a national plant. Most Nigerians don't even know the national plant. That's how interesting it is. So during my college days, I was lucky to have studied zoology as an undergraduate and as a master's student. During my master's, I became more interested in conservation because I worked in a forest reserve. I worked on the birds in the forest reserve, how they use their habitat. So I experienced the problem wild animals and plants face in the forest. A good one, I'll show you pictures. I experienced firsthand cartridges in the forest, animals being cut down, forest, immature forest trees being cut down, logs of wood traveling through the forest daily. Just imagine. This uh, multiple trees being cut down daily out of the forest every day, every day. I was something needs to be done. If nothing is done, there will be no more animals and plants for the next generation. The only year that oh so 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 animal was in this forest, they won't be able to see and they won't even know. I said, oh, so more needed to be done. This inspired me to become active in conservation. So what did I study? I actually studied birds. In Nigeria, we detest or we have an aversion for birds generally. No one wants to own a bird. No one wants to have anything to do with bird. We have an evil connotation. With bed. So I decided to study it and see how I can help birds in Nigeria. And helping to find information that can help them survive in the forest. So what is part of the job of being a conservationist? You have to be in the field. Though it's interesting to be in the field, it also has its own challenges. The interesting part is you get to enjoy nature firsthand. You get to enjoy the, the serene environment. You get to be in the field. 
These are pictures of me in the field. These are the interesting part where you get to smile. Inside the natural forest area. And these are some of the birds found in the reserve. Challenges faced in the field. As we all know, there are work challenges faced in the field as a female. Work as a, this is a very good example of a picture. This is me on, uh, on the blue with a book. So see, as a female, you get exposed in the forest to dangers of being injured by wild animals. Also, as a female, you get you are disregarded. Many people don't want to listen to what you have to say, especially community members. No one wants to hear you. You are being disregarded as a female. As a female, you get to push push through this road. Just like the man, you, you get to face so many challenges like this in the forest. And no one tells you that there is no, no bathroom like you have in your home. You know, the men, they're still comfortable. They can still, I think they can do um, their stuff easily in the field, unlike the female. You don't want to be on when you're in the forest. You, you can't take it because there's no way you'll be able to freshen up like when you're at home in the forest. No one tells you this path. Like in the forest, there is no communication, no phone because there's no network. When the interesting part is you get to enjoy nature first time. This is Pangolin, the most threatened mammal in the world. This is the most trafficked mammal. So getting to enjoy holding these animals in the field is part of the advantages of being in the field. This is me collecting a bed to shame. This is the battle. So how do we build a career in conservation as a woman? I'll, I'll say start locally. Start locally. Identify a group doing what you want to achieve and join, join to support them. A good example for me, I joined the Nigerian Bed Atlas team, which helps to map the distribution of beds in Nigeria. Through that, I was able to lead a, the team in my state in Nigeria to carry out a survey. And also this helped me in learning more new skills that could not be learned in school. So you, you will not be taught everything in school, especially when you're from the third world country, Africa. Not all things will be taught in school. You learn on the field. There are so many things that are being learned on the field. So through volunteering, through starting locally, you get to an opportunity to learn more from people already doing what you're doing. Have a mentor. Have someone you can ask questions. Ask someone you can look up to when you have issues in the field. Apply for grants. No matter how hard it is, just keep applying. You will get so many no as a woman. Even as a man, you will get so many no. As long as you don't give up, you're going to get it. If it is to go ahead to further your education, to get more, to gain more experience, go for it. Don't be shy that because you're a woman, uh, you, you feel you won't, they won't be able to pick you because most people, uh, conservation is gender biased, I would say that to an extent. Because most people feel males should, they feel females are weak, generally. They feel females are weak. Females would not be able to do some stuff in the field. But sometimes females 
and women generally have proved this to be wrong. There are so many women doing great things in the field of conservation today. Finally, I would like to say to the women who are working in the field or who wants to work in the field, aim I, don't be intimidated by your background. The only thing that can limit you is you yourself. Your gender is, should be a plus to you because things are getting better. Everybody wants to be gender inclusive. And as for the men, we should value women and know that there are biases or just um, or there's some um, opposition, which are natural, that women face when in the field. And I believe if women are given more opportunities, nature will be much more protected because we, women, we are not nurturers. So we can nurture nature well. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Oyemi. Um, from one woman to another and the over 50% half female speakers we had on this session. I can say that we're doing good work in conservation and we gotta just keep our heads to the ground. So thank you everyone for attending. Uh, a special thank you to our presenters. You're the ones that made this a truly special session. Um, we are the ones who've made the Global Youth Summit a reality. You as participants are speakers. So thank you all for coming forward. Um, this session is the first of two for Gabe and myself. Tomorrow at this same time, uh, we will be doing a more interactive networking session, um, also in, titled I am a connector. So if you're interested in getting to engage a little bit more tomorrow, talk a bit more about the work you do, um, your own stories, please join us for that. I think it'll be a lot of fun. Um, once again, thank you everyone and have a good rest of your day, morning, evening, wherever you're at. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, Melissa, Gab. Thank you. Thank you so much. Be in touch. Thanks, yeah, everyone. Sure. Thanks, everyone.